does not conquer Everest any more than Everest conquers man. For a few brief minutes, once in a while, men have reached the summit of Everest, but how much more often have they been chased away, victims of bad luck, storm or their own weakness? We have forgotten that the mountain still holds the master card, that it will grant success only in its own good time. Why else does Everest retain its deep fascination? Why would you want to climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. It was one of the most impossible dreams to be dreamt. To dream about Everest, to plan a civilian expedition on it, was a brave attempt even in thought itself. In the year 1982, Giri Premier Mountaineering Group was formed. In these past 30 years, consistently organizing different expeditions in Himalayas, I think is our highlight. And in these 30 eventful years, we have arranged about 35 extremely tough expeditions in the Himalayas. And in this league, scaling Everest was our next ambitious step. The 8th of January 2011 was when Giri Premi announced its Everest expedition of a 21-member team. Umesh Jirpe, a tax consultant by profession, was the leader of this expedition. Umesh, considered as an excellent leader and taskmaster and a devoted member of Giri Premi, was to carry the expedition on his shoulders and while doing so, boost the morale of his team as well as himself. With an unthinkable budget of 3.15 crore rupees, everyone saw it as a Herculean task rather than an impossible one. But Umesh had an answer to this. If you support, it is possible. The actual particulars of the event are unclear, but the year was 1852 and the setting was the offices of the Great Trigonometrical Survey of India in the northern hill station of Dehradun. A clerk rushed into the chambers of Sir Andrew Waugh, India's surveyor general, and exclaimed that a Bengali named Radha Nath Sikdar had discovered the highest mountain in the world. Designated Peak 15, the mountain in question jutted from the spine of the Himalaya in the forbidden kingdom of Nepal. In 1865, War bestowed the name Mount Everest on Peak 15 in honor of Sir George Everest, his predecessor as Surveyor General. As it happened, Tibetans who would live to the north of the mountain had a more mellifluous name for it, Chomulungma, which translates to Goddess Mother of the World. And the Nepalese who resided to the south called the peak Sagarmatha, that is, Goddess of the Sky. George Lay Mallory was the driving force behind the first three expeditions to the peak. At first light on the 8th of June 1924, Mallory and Andrew Irvine departed the highest camp for the top. However, neither of them was ever seen again. Early in the morning on the 29th of May 1953, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay set out for the top, breathing bottled oxygen. The climbing was strenuous and sketchy, but both persisted, and thus, shortly before noon, did Hillary and Tenzing become the first men to stand atop Mount Everest and gaze outward from the highest point on our planet. Since their historic ascent, scores of other climbing expeditions have attempted these forbidden heights, and many have succeeded. 
India too has carried out a few successful expeditions on Everest. But most of them were army organized expeditions. Such expeditions hardly face the difficulties of funding. But these difficulties arise for civilian expeditions. This was evident when an Everest of fundraising started for Giri Premi volunteers. Personal meetings, corporate houses, Giri Premi volunteers left no stone unturned. But the initial response was heartbreaking. We genuinely thought that because it involved Everest, we would get a terrific response from the corporate world and many would step up to support this expedition. But this sport is played only in extreme places and there is no audience for it there. So we couldn't muster a good response in our favor from the corporate world. And so we decided that we should propose this expedition to the common man. Telbaila is a famous mountaineering wall near Lonaula. Five senior citizens, including myself, scaled this difficult wall and registered our support to this wonderful expedition in its own way. A huge cycle rally was organized in Pune. Around a thousand people, including school kids to senior citizens, were a part of this and supported our Everest expedition with great enthusiasm. Karsuba is the highest peak in Maharashtra. We invited mountain lovers all over Maharashtra to support our expedition to the world's highest mountain from Karsubai. And as a response to it, around 400 supporters ranging from 7 years of age to 92 years old joined us enthusiastically. But soon more positive response started pouring in. Heart-touching tales were woven into every rupee collected. School children donated their tiny amounts of pocket money. Some gave away their daily wages, while others gave whopping amounts. And the team started getting into the groove. Some stopped their education halfway. Some quit their jobs, while others entrusted their business to someone else. And the team members started coming to live in Giri Premi's office. A sort of gurukul started. It was meant not only for team building, but also for correct diet, exercise and a tough regimen. On one hand was the daily workout and on the other hand was the effort to collect the required amount. Slowly but surely the funds started building. The training program was rigorous. It included climbing Parvati Hill with a partner on the back in the mornings and exhaustive running sessions in the evenings at Sanas ground. On the weekends, they would climb Sihagat by eventually increasing the load on their backs up to 30 kilograms. To become mentally strong, they practiced Brahma Vidya daily, which included Dhyana, Pranayama and different types of breathing. Finally, the day arrived. The climbing team consisted of 13 people. All of them had already undergone the basic courses in mountaineering. Also, each of them had scaled numerous peaks in the Sayadris and the Himalayas. It included Umesh Jirpe as the team leader, Surendra Jalihar, a businessman, Bhushan Harshe, who dreamt of a career in mountaineering, Dekraj Adhikari from Nepal, now based in Pune, Anand Mali, working as an outdoor expert, Ganesh More, an engineer, Rahul Yelange, a highly skilled rock climber, Rupesh Khopre, a software engineer, Prasad Joshi, a cost accountant, Krishna Dhokle, who worked at the Hafkin Institute, Chetan Ketkar, who owned a pottery business, Sachin Deng, an avid mountaineer, and the youngest member of the expedition, Ashish Mane. The premise of Pune Station was swarming with people. Everybody was excited and to the brim. The atmosphere was charged with hugs and slogans. Waving hands and tear-filled eyes bade goodbye to all. A flag was presented by the Indian Mountaineering Foundation. The President of India at that time, Srimati Pratibha Tai Patil, presented the team with the national tricolor. 
the team was bestowed a chance to flutter this tricolour on the world's highest peak. The team was moved with this national responsibility. The team reached Kathmandu to raise the goody for a prosperous new year ahead. At Kathmandu, expedition teams usually spend time buying supplies and arranging travel visas. There is always some necessary paperwork to be done, permits to be obtained and vital climbing equipment like altimeters, snow goggles, shoes, feather jackets, down suits etc. to be purchased. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, is a surprisingly small city. There are lanes and still smaller lanes branching off from big ones and going from here to there into still smaller alleys. Peak Promotions Wang Chu Sherpa and his colleagues were going to help with the organization of this expedition. The airplane crossed the end of the runway and its shadow leapt out over the rice paddies and mountains. As it rose above the diffused fog blanketing the valley, the Himalaya emerged. Their crystalline forms pushed against a navy blue sky as if visibly being thrust upward by the colliding land masses of India and Eurasia. The plane rolled left to the east and headed for the airstrip of Lukla. At 9,000 feet, the Lukla air was cool and decidedly thinner. Aromas of juniper fires yaked down, displaced briefly by a light breeze of nostril tingling glacial air flowing down from the Khumbu and Tibet, the smell of Everest. Slowly, the team moved out of town and headed up the Dund Kosi Valley. Emerald fields of new wheat and bright yellow blooming mustard formed a quilt along the deep ravine. From homes and tea shops perched on terraces along the trail, Grandmothers carrying infants in cradles waved the team in for chai. As the trail went from forest to village, the team continued north to Pakring, a small community straddling two sides of the Dud Kosi, connected by a rickety bridge. Strings of prayer flags were strung across the hillsides and ancient Buddhist chortens and walls of exquisitely carved money stones stood sentinel over even the highest passes. It's all uphill from here. With steady and rocking gates, climbers and yaks made their way up 2,000 vertical feet towards Namche Bazaar. Namche occupies a huge tilting bowl proportioned like a giant satellite television disc midway up a precipitous mountainside. Twenty minutes beyond the village, the team rounded a bend and arrived at a breathtaking overlook. Dwarfing Amadablam was the icy thrust of Everest itself. The team stared at the peak for a long time trying to comprehend what it would be like to be standing on the gale-swept vertex. The summit looked so cold, so high, so impossibly far away. As the team members continued walking up the trail, their emotions oscillated between raw excitement and nervous anticipation. From this point forward, their world would be a barren, monochromatic expanse of rock and wind-blown ice. And despite the team's measured pace, they had begun to feel the effects of the altitude. The team reached Dingboche. In order to be prepared for Everest, they decided to scale Island, which is at 21,000 feet. This was necessary both as a practice and acclimatization. Island Peak, also known as Imjatse, is a mountain in the Himalayas of eastern Nepal. 
The peak was named Island in 1951 by Eric Shipton's expedition team since it looks like an island in a sea of ice when seen from Dingboche. On the 7th of April, the entire team scaled island. to Tukla, above the hamlet of Duglaha, is Chupkolare, the site of a number of large stone cairns erected by the Sherpas. Twenty stone monuments stood in a somber row along the crest of the glacier's terminal moraine, overlooking the mist-filled valley, memorials to climbers who had died on Everest. From Lobuche, the base camp is no easy jaunt. Crossing Lobuche and Gorakshev, the team finally reached the base camp. The Sherpas welcomed everyone by presenting khatads. The Sherpa support staff had arrived at the base camp a few days ahead of the others and had carved out tent sites from the clutter of ice and rock on the margin of the glacier. The Khumbu glacier is ice under stress creaking and bumping and clicking and snapping and cracking and squeaking. It's always reminding the climbers that they are camping on a dynamic sheet of ice. Meltwater sluiced furiously down through innumerable surface and subterranean channels, creating a ghostly harmonic rumble that resonated through the body of the glacier. The Sherpas made team practice sessions near the base camp knowing the difficulties that lay ahead. Sherpas are mountain people, devoutly Buddhist, whose forebears migrated south from Tibet four or five centuries ago. The heart of Sherpa country is Khumbu, a handful of valleys draining the southern slopes of Mount Everest, because most Sherpas had lived for generations in villages situated between 9,000 and 14,000 feet they were psychologically adapted to the rigors of high altitude. They build tents, make hot chai, lunch, plan the next moves amidst cracking of jokes and laughter. They can be truly termed as the lifeline of an expedition. The Giri Premi expedition was supported by a team of highly skilled Sherpas. These included Kame Sherpa, Pemba Sherpa, Mingmar Dorji Sherpa, Pemba Rinji Sherpa, Jangbu Sherpa, Old Norbu Sherpa, Norbu Bhote Sherpa, Dindi Sherpa, Dakipa Sherpa, Dorji Sherpa, Lama DJ Sherpa, and Mingmar Sherpa. Sherpas and climbers normally won't climb above the base camp until the puja ceremony of purification and propitiation has been completed. The base camp puja is commonly described as a request for permission to climb the mountain and for protection and good weather. Not only must the climbers and Sherpas be purified before setting foot on the mountain, so must their equipment. To close the ceremony, everyone sings in unison in a gradually rising tone and repeating this the third time, they launched the flower skyward in a joyous, chaotic moment. May the gods be victorious and rub the flower in one another's hair and on their cheeks, signifying that they wished to live until their hair and beards turn white. When I was a young kid, uh, I saw a documentary by Bachchendri Pal and I thought that I needed to scale the Everest and that thought uh, stayed with me at the back of my mind. I never thought in my wildest of dreams that I would get to climb Mount Everest as my first peak. To begin with, I was born in the mountains and so I simply love them and I love to scale new heights and so I want to climb Mount Everest. The joy which I will derive by climbing Mount Everest and uh, happiness stemming from the hardships involved in this expedition makes me go for Mount Everest. Ascending Everest is a long, tedious process 
more like a mammoth construction project than climbing as the team had previously known it. Sherpas would progressively establish a series of four camps above the base camp, each approximately 2,000 feet higher than the last by shuttling cumbersome loads of food, cooking fuel and oxygen from encampment to encampment until the requisite material had been fully stocked at 26,000 feet on the South Coal. This process generally takes a month or longer. One may ask, why all the moving up and down before the climb? Because acclimatization is time consuming. At the extreme altitudes, physical performance decreases at an accelerating rate. To reach Camp 1, the danger was that of the Kumbu Icefall. This maze of crevices, seracs and ice blocks the size of apartment buildings has claimed more lives than any part of the mountain. Looking up at the Kumbu Icefall from the base camp, one feels about to be deluged by a tidal wave of gigantic ice cubes. This is also the challenging and fun part of the climb. Only, you must not be there at the wrong time. The icefall crevices are so deep that when Sherpas look into their blue-black depths, they often joke that they are looking into America. After crossing the icefall successfully, and later reaching Camp 1, the team returned to the base camp. The base camp bustled like an anthill. It is curious that having voluntarily removed oneself as far as possible from the trappings of so-called civilization, expeditions then appear to vie with one another in creating alternative civilizations of ingenious comfort and complexity. The flocks of yellow-billed chooks soaring on updrafts, their movements matched the playfulness of the wind itself. The kerosene and propane stoves were always going, and the team hung out in the kitchen for warmth. This ad hoc village would serve as their home for the next six weeks. The amphitheater opened to the southwest. So it was flooded with sunlight since morning on clear afternoons. But the moment the sun dipped behind the conical summit of Pumori, immediately west of the base camp, the temperature plummeted into the teens. The toll of unwell Sherpas and mountaineers slowly started accumulating at the base camp. A few of them had to go back home. In the midst of this, a Sherpa who had successfully climbed Everest ten times died. The news of the first death of the season had struck. The team gathered their belongings and embarked for Camp 2, four miles and 1,700 vertical feet above. The route took them up the general sloping floor of the western comb, the highest box canyon on earth, a horseshoe-shaped defile gouged from the heart of the Everest Massif by the Kumbu Glacier. Morning, 10 a.m. Without any warning, there was a huge avalanche from Nuktse Peak. Tons and tons of snow started coming towards the team. There was a major stir at the base camp. Everybody thought everything was finished. There was a long silence. And then the walkie-talkie crackled. <laughs> Team camp 
एक दह बारह पावल मी आ चेतन मगवत नशीबा चेतन ल माला से एक रीच ऐसी खाली आम्मी घुसलो एक दोन तीन मिनट का ही सुचत नौत संप्लीट टोक नाइलांस पाउल रुदास होता आम तो वाटल कि आता का खरना है दबलो In about 10 minutes it calmed down and the powder settled down and the area around us became visible then we called out to each other and saw that everyone was okay at their positions even under these circumstances the team decided to proceed towards camp 2 this route looks seemingly easy but is difficult to walk and is very tiring at 21300 feet Camp 2 is set in the majestic sculpted cirque of the upper end of the Western Combe. The team rested there for the day. After the blow of the avalanche, the team had to endure another one. Sachin Deng had to return from Camp 2 because of bleeding through his nose. The doctors advised him complete rest. Here, each morning came with new dangers lurking around. There's a reward for your effort and a lot of fatigue too. But mountaineers like the fatigue. They like to wake up in the morning feeling stronger than they were the day before. The chief objective of this expedition by Giri Premi was to promote the sport of mountaineering to the people of India. Mountaineering is termed as the mother of all adventure sports. This is the only sport where you are a player, a competitor. a judge and a spectator all bundled into one mountaineering spreads energy in the society and boosts the confidence of fellow beings it also keeps people healthy and fit which in turn increases the productivity of an individual organization and ultimately the nation mountaineering requires experience athletic ability and technical knowledge to maintain safety You learn to perform and how to handle a situation that may be life-threatening. The Nehru Institute of Mountaineering and the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute are rated as one of the best mountaineering institutes in India and are also considered to be among the most prestigious mountaineering institutes in Asia. Giri Premi envisions Indian mountaineering to be taken to a global level. thus aiding indian mountaineers to achieve unimaginable heights climbing a high mountain may be a modern man's outlet approaching confronting and then overcoming the weakness and the demons that haunt us and obstruct us for this quest everest offers the ideal tableau now the team started for camp 3 once again the khumbu ice fall a night's rest at camp 2 and then proceeding towards camp 3 immediately above rose the lotse face a vast tilted sea of ice that gleamed like dirty chrome in the slanting light of the dawn as a safety measure expeditions always attach a series of ropes to this slope from the bottom to the top and climbers are supposed to protect themselves by clipping a short safety tether to the fixed ropes as they ascend but it wasn't meant to go smoothly soon began another difficulty the intermittent fuselage of stones whizzing down the face from above started it was a major task to avoid them and climb at the same time and one stone hit bhushan harshe right on his forehead tearing his helmet apart Even in that condition, Bhushan bravely managed to reach Camp Three. The team climbed the steep Lotse face to Camp Three, where tent sites had been carved out of the face itself. High winds continued to blast the southeast ridge far above them, and more nervous tension prevailed. Their faces were swollen and sunburned, and they spoke little about the mountain. we literally counted our steps to reach here and now finally we have reached camp 3 
सो ऑल आर स्ट्रगलिंग अ बिट लिटिल प्रॉब्लम विद नॉर्मल ब्रीथिंग नो वन इज इन नीड ऑफ आर्टिफिशियल ऑक्सीजन एज ऑफ यट सो इट्स अ गुड साइन After resting for the night when sleep is difficult the team returned to the base camp everyone was high with confidence now remained the summit push climbing for the summit but for that the team had to wait for the weather window what climbers primarily look for is a prolonged period that is 4 to 5 days of stable weather with no jet stream winds this is called the weather window that's the time to go for it for the climbers weather is a gamble and a bad day on everest can certainly be deadly days passed by but there was no accurate news of the climate the whole of the base camp was dampened in spirit the combined tension of weather logistics crowding and the dangerous mission of climbing the mountain had been building finally the indian meteorological department gave the 19th of may as the date for the weather window umesh decided along with the sherpas and announced the date also seeing the overall conditions umesh decided to stay back at the base camp and oversee the entire expedition umesh was disappointed but knew that his role in supporting the team from the base camp was important for assuring their safe return It was spring again. There was joy and happiness. Everybody was excited for the final climb. Modern climbing gear may be lighter and warmer, but the mountain hasn't changed. Your equipment and your body must be ready. Here it became evident that the summit day will be even more difficult because you are weak even when you start out. It will be the other climbers, the team, and the teamwork that will determine whether they reach the top. Tomorrow morning, we will start for our summit bid. Uh, there are many thoughts cluttered in my mind. A little nervousness also. It's the first time we are going on such a height. Also, we'll be using oxygen for the first time. So, don't know how that's going to feel. How are we going to fare? Whether everything will be fine. Also, fearing about frostbite. So, little nervousness and apprehension. And still, we are confident that we will reach to the top. The top of Everest. Two vertical miles above seemed so impossibly distant that the team members tried to limit their thoughts to Camp Two, their destination for the day. By the time the first sunlight struck the glacier, they were in the maw of the Western Coom, grateful that the ice fall was below them and that they would have to go through it only one more time on the final trip down. Early that afternoon, they arrived at Camp Two, which had become like a second home. At Camp Two came another blow. Bhushan Harshe returned to the base camp because of breathing problems. The doctors asked Bhushan to stop his expedition. On the 17th of May, the team set out for Camp Three. When they arrived that afternoon, they crawled into the tense perch on the snow shelves they had dug into the Lhotse face. this was a new route to camp 3 uh, last time's route was very steep and had a danger of rock fall this new route was longer and we took around 90 minutes more to reach here the weather is good tomorrow early morning we have to start for camp 4 the south pole from there we will have our summit push actually this is the epitome of all the hard work for past 2 months The next morning they continued upward. The guides handed out oxygen canisters, regulators and masks to everyone. For the remainder of the climb, they would be breathing compressed gas. At 25,900 feet, they paused on the crest of the spur to drink some water and take in the view. Extravagantly illuminated by the midday sun, the Everest summit pyramid loomed through an interminable gauze of clouds. The team then crossed the Geneva spur 
and in the early afternoon reach summit camp at 26,000 feet. South Como, a forlorn plateau of bulletproof ice and windswept boulders, it occupies a broad notch between the upper ramparts of Lhotse and Everest. After setting up camp, they had finished melting snow and ice for their water bottles and had gagged down a few bites of food. Above this is the death zone. Humans cannot survive extended periods above this height. Here, the mountain ceases to be a source of joy. Suddenly, the wind seems louder, the cold colder, the legs weaker and the mountain higher. And especially when one has been on the mountain for 10 weeks, you are homesick, tired and have lost weight. The climbers who have patience, persistence and reserves of motivation only will be the ones who summit. The 10 of them set out from the South Col, climbing by their headlamps and the dim light of the stars. Their visible world defined by the reach of their headlamps. With every step, they were thinking about their pace, their breathing, their posture, the time frame for reaching the southeast ridge and the weather. From the balcony, the team started on the 1,100 vertical feet ascent to the south summit. By the time they reached it, they had been moving continuously for nine hours. They were now only 300 vertical feet from the summit but had yet to surmount the treacherous Hillary Step, one of the most famous pitches in all of mountaineering. It is 40 feet of near vertical rock and ice and looked daunting. Also, the route was laced with a confusing and entangling maze of old fixed ropes. Now, the peak was just 10 steps away. Prasad Joshi reached the summit. Soon after, Krishna Dhokle and Tekraj Adhikari reached there. Tekraj connected with the base camp. Krishna, you are Okay, okay. Congrats. Hello, meet Adhikari. reached Pune. The Giri Premi office knew no bounds of happiness. Soon after, Chetan Ketkar, then Surendra Jalihar, Rupesh Khopde, Rahul Yelange and finally Ashish Mane reached the top. Straddling the top of the world, one foot in China and the other in Nepal, they cleared the ice from their oxygen masks, hunched a shoulder against the wind and stared absolutely down at the vastness of Tibet. They understood on some dim, detached level that the sweep of the earth beneath their feet was a spectacular sight. They briefly enjoyed the view from the summit as they knew they couldn't stay too long. Getting to the summit is optional, but getting down is mandatory. The descent from Everest's upper slopes is the single most dangerous part of the climb. The team would need to pass other climbers who are on their way up to the summit and would have to unclip their carabiners from the fixed line and then reclip many times to get around people with unknown mountaineering skills. The 22nd of May Three days after summit, the team reached the base camp safely. With broad smiles on their faces, the joy in the heart of fluttering the tricolor on the top was overflowing from those who had returned victorious.
climbing Everest is a process, not an event. A lot of it is tedious. Much of the satisfaction and feeling of achievement when it gets down to it is very private. When I reached on the summit, I almost cried. Tears of joy that after all the hard work, I finally reached the top. I think my two years of hard work has finally paid off. It was so beautiful up there that it is difficult to state it in words. It was mind-blowing. When I was on the summit, I missed my parents a lot. When I reached the summit, uh, the view is very panoramic. It is very identical to the view we get from the Sayyadri. I would like to credit my mother first. She is the one who encouraged me to go to Himalayas, do a basic course and then advanced course. Uh, and then of course to Umesh Jirpe and Giri Premi for providing us this wonderful platform where we could scale the Everest. However, amongst the team of 10, Anand Mari and Ganesh More could not summit due to problems in their oxygen supply. Summit was like hardly three hours away. I was sad because I don't know if I can do this again. But I am fortunate that I reached Camp 4 alive because Everest is Everest. I am not uh, sad that I couldn't summit because uh, it's more important to be alive today. Uh, in such dire circumstances, I battled and I returned safe. So I am happy. On the day of the summit alone, around seven mountaineers had lost their lives. The total casualty for this season had reached 14. When you decide not to pursue further and turn back, passing people on your way down, you think maybe we didn't make a right decision. Maybe tomorrow the weather will improve. But turning back is never a bad decision. It gives you the chance to try again. On the 2nd of June, the team returned home to Pune. And with no surprise, it was Diwali in June this year. Several seasons of good weather have led people to think of Everest as benevolent. But Everest can be a place where people can't see or move, where tents are ripped apart, where all the high-tech gear in the world cannot save you. Yet, Everest casts a spell and many remain undeterred. Climbing Everest is about the deprivations, the challenge, the rare physical beauty, the movement and the rhythm. And it is partly about risk. You learn about yourself, about what happens when you abandon comfort and warmth and a daily routine. Clearly, some climbers are on a quest and set out not so much to conquer a physical obstacle as to attain a new level of understanding of themselves. Once in their lifetime, every person should journey to a place where legends live, where everything is bigger than life. For the Giri Premi team, Everest has always represented nature at its most powerful, most awe-inspiring, most inconquerable. When Mount Everest was scaled, the phrase commonly used in the West to describe the feat was the conquest of Everest. An Oriental, whose writings have been deeply influenced by Taoism, remarked, We would put the matter differently. We would speak of the befriending of Everest. <laughs>